everybody in on this beautiful day in Oklahoma and uh, for those of you out on television again we just love to invite you to sit down and study with us I uh, hopefully don't preach at you but uh, once in a while it almost gets close doesn't it but anyway we attempt to just teach the book and uh, help folks to read it and understand it on their own and I think we're making headway my goodness according to the mail we get it uh, it's really encouraging that folks are beginning to enjoy their own Bible. So we're just going to pick right up where we left off in our last taping, and uh, we finished in Acts chapter 3, so I'm just going to start with the last couple verses in Acts chapter 3, and then move on. Connecting the dots is what Jerry put on it. We just started at Genesis, and that's just what we're doing. We're just connecting the dots, and uh, I always like to let people be assured, be confident that this book is true. It is the Word of God, and it's the only Word of God. And uh, for that reason, we like to show how everything fits. Okay, we're in the middle four programs now of Book 75. So if you want to know how many programs there are available, why well, you just multiply 75 times 12, and you'll get pretty close. So now in Acts chapter 3, review a little bit of how Peter is ending up now his second message after Pentecost. And as I've been emphasizing, it's still all Jewish. Everything is still concerned with the temple and all the covenant promises made to Israel. And uh, hopefully we're going to point out a few things that I've even neglected to see before. Not that I didn't see it, but I just didn't think it was important enough to bring it to the top. But we're going to look at that in a little bit. And so now Peter is ending up his second message after Pentecost. Already a few weeks have probably gone by, maybe even a few months. And look what he says now again in uh, verse 24, 5 and 6, and then we'll move on. Yea, all the prophets. Well, now, if you're a Bible student, what's he referring to? The Old Testament. See? All the Old Testament. The prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold or prophesied of what days? These days. Now, you remember, oh my goodness, how long ago was it when I had Coverdale's statements on the screen? If you're going to be a Bible student, the first thing you do is what? Who's writing? Then what, Luther? You know them. What's he writing? What's the next thing? To whom is he writing? When is it written? What are the circumstances? What went before? What follows after? Okay, so stop every time you come to a few words. Okay, what's he talking about here when he says, Samuel and those that follow after have spoken of these days? Ours? No, theirs. Where Israel was at this point in history, and that was shortly after the crucifixion, 50 days later, we had Pentecost, and that's where we were in our last taping. Oh, and now we're some months beyond Pentecost, but it's still all part of that prophetic end time so far as the Old Testament was concerned. Maybe I should have had them flip the board, but I won't do it anymore. We'll do it in our next program. So that I can show you in the timeline that here we're coming. How can I do this so I'm going the right direction for you? I've got to go out. Here we're coming from the Old Testament, past the crucifixion, his ascension, Pentecost, and Israel, a lot of them are responding, as we're going to see in a little bit, but percentage-wise for the whole nation, just a few. But nevertheless, the emphasis has been that God is winding up the prophetic statements of the Old Testament. The end is in view. All they're going to have to do is go past the tribulation, and Christ would return, and in would come that kingdom. They had no idea of a 2,000-year church age. Don't, don't ever think, well, what about this to it? No, they didn't know that. They were thinking everything was just going to come right down the way the prophets had foretold. And so that's why he said, in these last days. See what a difference one word can make? Now verse 25, addressing the nation of Israel. You are the children of the what again? The prophets. They were the ones to whom the, all the Old Testament prophets wrote. Well, like he said, where do you start? Samuel. Who's the next great prophet? David. And then Solomon got his words in, you know, with Ecclesiastes and so forth. 
And then you start the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then all those 12 minor prophets, all of them writing pretty much on the same level, prophesying this glorious earthly kingdom that God's going to give to Israel. And so all of the word from Samuel until we get to where Peter is today, Israel was being admonished to look for this glorious king and his kingdom. See? But from our vantage point, they rejected it. And so that whole program had to be laid aside, and God, as we're going to see before the afternoon is over, hopefully, brought up the other dispensation through the Apostle Paul, which we call the Age of Grace. Totally unknown to all these prophets, they never once said one word concerning this Gentile Age of Grace. It was all directed to Israel and her coming kingdom. All right, now then, verse 25 again. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant. Now, you remember we did a whole series on covenants a year or two ago, that all the Old Testament covenants were not between God and the world. They were between God and Israel. See, the covenants belong to Israel. I'm going to put a statement on the screen before the afternoon is over by a famous dispensationalist who actually founded the Dallas Theological Seminary. And somebody sent it to me, and I'm going to hopefully get it on the screen before the afternoon is over, because I've never read it before, but he said word for word what I've said over and over. So that just confirms and gives me confidence, you see, that I'm not like the gal that sent this. She says, you're not some nut coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> no, no, I'm not alone. My, there are a lot of folks that see this the way I teach it. So uh, don't ever... Uh, don't ever get second thoughts. Well, wait a minute. Maybe Les is just out on left field. No, I'm not in left field. Okay. So he says, you're the children of the prophets, verse 25, which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, see, way back in Genesis 12, and in thy seed, that is the offspring of Abraham, which would be the nation of Israel, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Well, who was included in that seed of Abraham? Jesus Christ. And it was through Jesus and his work of the cross that he reached to the whole human race and not just Israel, see? All right, now then, verse 26, and then we're going to move on. Unto you first. Now remember our rule of Bible study. Who is he talking to? Israel, the Jew, see? So under you Jews first. That's where it all had to start. God having raised up his son Jesus after their rejecting him. And as Peter says in chapter 2, they killed him, but God raised him from the dead, so the king is still alive. He's still going to fulfill the prophecies. That's the whole thrust of these early chapters, that the one they killed was alive and he could still fulfill all the promises. See, So unto you first, Israel, having raised up his son Jesus, he sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And in my closing remarks, if I remember right, I made the statement. See, here God expects the whole nation to respond before he could actually fulfill the promises. But they didn't, only a small percentage. But on the other hand, when the next apostle comes, he never tells Paul, you're going to go out and win them all. You're going to win how many? Some. And that's where we are today. God is just calling out one here and one there. And uh, it's just the way Christendom has uh, unfolded. It's not the multitudes. It's the one here, one there, the sum. All right, now then, continuing on with Peter and uh, his Jerusalem believers there, all Jews. Come over with me now to chapter, oh, let's go to chapter 4. I was going to skip it and go on a little further. But let's stop at chapter 4, just for a verse or two. Starting at verse 32. Because so, what I'm going to show you this afternoon, we're not just dealing with a little flock, like a, a few chickens or something like that. We're dealing with thousands of people, which is only a small percentage of the whole, because Israel has always been between 5 and 10 million. But... Nevertheless, there are thousands of people that are responding to Peter's and the 11th message 
here in the nation of Israel. All right, so verse 32 of chapter 4, and the multitude, see, now that indicates a, a fairly large number of people. And the multitude of them that believed, now I got to stop again, believed what? That Christ died for their sins and rose from the dead? No, that hasn't been revealed yet. So what did they believe? Jesus was the Christ. That's so. Still under the law. Nothing has changed. They still keep the food laws. They still keep the Saturday Sabbath. They still keep the feast days. But now they have recognized that Jesus of Nazareth was that promised Messiah. And on that basis, God saved them. Now, you want to remember, salvation has always been by what? Faith. See? Always by faith. Well, go back to Adam. What was Adam's faith? You remember I showed it when we went back there some time ago? What was Adam's faith when he named his wife what? The mother of all living, Eve. Well, God told him they were going to die. So how does he know now that she's going to live long enough to have children? God told him. And how did Adam respond? He believed him. And what did God call it? Faith. See? God told Noah a flood was coming. Build an ark. How much did Noah know about water and arks and so forth? Nothing. But what did he do? He built the ark. On what basis? Faith. See? All right, now here comes Jesus into this religious little nation of Israel with all their temple worship and all their Old Testament prophets, and he proclaims himself as their Messiah and King. What did he expect them to do? Believe it. But only a few did. But now, since Pentecost, it's coming a little more. And so now we have the reference of multitudes have now believed that Jesus was the Christ. See? All right, so they believed they were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of things which he possessed was of his own, but they had all things common. Now stop and think. Here you've got multitudes of people, as we saw in our last taping, that had come in from every corner of the then known world, from out at the Far East all the way to probably Spain, maybe a few from Great Britain. Certainly all North Africa was now civilized and uh, under the Roman Empire. And so here these Jews have been coming from all the corners of the Roman Empire, and they literally filled the city of Jerusalem. But as I'm going to show you before the afternoon is over, most of them evidently stayed in Jerusalem and did not go back to their homeland out in the Gentile world. And why not? The king is coming. That's what I want to impress on you this afternoon. They stuck tight to Jerusalem because they were convinced that now that Christ had finished the work of the cross and had been raised from the dead, had ascended to glory, in short order, he would be coming back and fulfilling the promises made to Israel. And so many of them did not go back home. And they had it so good, as this passage is going to show us, why should they? My, when you got a free lunch, <laughs> why go back home and struggle? <laughs> See? All right, now just watch this attitude as we come through these verses. Now verse 33, or verse 32, I didn't finish it. Neither said any of them that ought or any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. What is that? That's pure communism. Now, we always think of communism on the evil side. But you see, this was a righteous communism. Nobody was claiming anything more than his neighbor. They all pooled their resources, and they were all living out of that common wealth that had now been accumulated. Now, you've got to remember, if you've got multitudes, thousands, because 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. And then every day from then on, multitudes were coming into salvation and were all glued to the, what I call the Jerusalem church, which I'll probably address next program. Now then, all of these people are pooling their resources. That's what it says. Now look at it. And with great power... 
God gave the apostles, the twelve, witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In other words, that they knew their king was alive. There's no salvation attached to it. That's where people miss the boat. Peter never says, believe that Christ died for your sins and rose from it. They never said that. All Peter says is that the one you killed is alive and he will yet come and bring in the kingdom. Now, is that so hard to understand? And you can look for it. Check me out. You won't find it associated with their salvation. It was merely the emphatic fact that he was alive. All right? So great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. In other words, the blessings were just flowing on this congregation of Jews in Jerusalem. Verse 34, neither were there any among them that lacked. What does that mean? Hey, nobody was going hungry. Nobody was going without necessary food and shelter. They had it pretty good, see? Nothing lacked. For as many as was possessors of lands or houses, what'd they do with them? Turn them in the cash. And what'd they do with the cash? Turned it into the 12 apostles, see? And so the wealth is accumulating. I've often said if they could have just invested that with 50% interest, they'd still be going. <laughs> but they didn't and they couldn't. And so, as we're going to see, in time, it ran out. And then we're going to end up with a bunch of what? Poor Jews. It's coming. Okay, stay with me. But here they've got nothing lacking. They've got ample funds. And so far, the 12 had been able to handle the paperwork, as we call it today, the administration of it all. Now, stop and think. Was that simple? Was well, that simple to be able to take care of thousands of people with all of their physical needs? Now, that took some administration work. That took paperwork. They had to know how much was going out, how much was coming in. All right, read on. Keep all that in your computer up here. And so, as many as had possessions of land or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold. See how plain that is? They brought it all to the twelve, verse 35, <clears throat> and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution, what does that entail? What I just was talking about. They had to administer this. They had to keep track of what was going out compared to what was coming in. And that somebody wasn't being corrupt and taking more than they needed. It took administration. It took paperwork. Okay, read on. Distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. What does that mean? Maybe a head of a household of five or six naturally needed more than a husband and a wife or a widow. See? All of this is just plain common sense if you'll stop and think it through. All right? Now verse 36. And Jose, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, the same Barnabas that will end up with the apostle Paul who was being interpreted, this son of consolation, was a Levite. He was of the tribe of the priests and of the country or the island of Cyprus. Now, if you know your geography, Cyprus has always been a rather productive piece of real estate. They've got beautiful vineyards and orchards, and uh, Cyprus is a good place to own some property. All right, so he owned land on the country of Cyprus. Verse 37, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what I did the last couple of days that I'd never done before, do you think Barnabas was the only one that did that? Think. No, there must have been a number of Jews that probably had property. Who knows? North Africa, Italy, Greece, you name it. And they evidently did the same thing. Now, if you don't want to agree with me, that's fine. I'm just projecting here what I feel human beings would do. If Barnabas did it, no doubt many other wealthy Jews did the same thing. Sold their property wherever it was and brought the money. So here they're piled up with wealth. I know they were. They had a bunch of it. All right, now then, the numbers are increasing. 
And uh, I'll jump across the page in my Bible now to chapter 5, verse 12. <coughs> chapter 5, verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Now, you remember, I think it was in the last taping, or the one before, I don't know, but I made the statement, I made it as clear as I knew how, why were the twelve given the same signs and wonders that Jesus practiced? Same purpose. Now let's back up to his earthly ministry. What was the reason for his signs and wonders and miracles? To convince Israel who he was, see? What are they still trying to do? Convince Israel the one they crucified was the Christ. See? Nothing has changed except the work of the cross is now completed. Everything is in, in, has been set for us as Gentile, but so far as Israel is concerned, it was just an extension of these Old Testament promises. And now the twelve are performing the same kind of wonders and miracles that Jesus did for the same purpose. Convincing Israel who Jesus of Nazareth really were. All right, now verse 13. And of the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them and believers. See? I'll keep it straight. Not grace age believers yet. What kind of believers? Jews believing who Jesus was. Still in the kingdom program. They're still looking for the king. All right? And so believers were the more added to the Lord. What's the next word, at least in the King James? Multitudes. See? Now, so did you catch what I'm driving at? Go back to chapter 2, verse 41, honey. Go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So that you'll get what I'm driving at, that we're not just talking about a couple dozen or even a couple hundred. We're talking about thousands of Jews all gathered here in Jerusalem around the temple area or wherever. Now, where they had a thought of this during the night last night, the scripture never tells us, but where do you suppose they fed all these people? Where do you suppose they kept all the things that were necessary for the daily needs? I don't know, but it must have been a big facility, someplace there in Jerusalem. Because I remember when I was in service, at one time we ate in a battalion mess hall, and that thing was huge. And thousands of guys could come in and eat within the same hour. But it took facilities, took big kitchens, took umpteen tables. That's the term we're going to see here. All right, we're doing the same thing with these believing Jews in Jerusalem. Thousands of them. I didn't read it yet, did I? Chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word, that is Peter's, were baptized, and the same day, the day of Pentecost, were added unto them, that is, the Jerusalem church, starting with 120, remember. How many? 3,000. That's a good bunch of people in anybody's language. All right, now on top of that then, we have here in chapter 5 that multitudes are still coming. Now, what are we ending up with? A bunch of people that are not working <laughs> They are all eating and everything out of that common kitty, is the way I used to call it, from all the accumulation of the wealth of these people who were now selling what they had and bringing it to the apostles' feet. So all I'm trying to impress on you this half hour, that we're dealing with a lot of people. And they're all dependent on the administration of these 12 Apostles. All right, now, got three minutes left. Let's jump over to chapter 6. Now, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now, we're still on this same level playing field. We're dealing with these Jews that are coming in to the Jerusalem church who are becoming believers in the kingdom gospel, looking for the king and the kingdom to come in short order. Now, verse 6. Now, in those days, while all this is going on, and it could already be a couple, three years down the road, 
In those days when the number of the disciples or believers or these followers of Peter and the eleven, <clears throat> when the number was multiplied, there arose a murmuring. Now, you know what I always call that? That's the first crack in that beautiful veneer of this glorious congregation of believing Jews. Remember it said back in chapter 4, they were all of one accord. Everything was just hunky-dory. No arguments, no disputes. All of a sudden, there's a crack in it. And what is it? That there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. All right, now you have to know a little bit of Greek. Who were the Grecians? They were Jews who had been raised and learned the language and the customs of a foreign country. They were Grecians. Greeks or Gentiles of any sort. All right, so out of this multitude of Jews that had come in from every corner of the world and had become believers, become part of this great Jewish congregation with all this accumulated wealth to meet their every need, there were Grecian widows. They were not homeland Jews. They were Jews from other areas of the world. And you know, it's no different in Israel today. You know, I read an article in Jerusalem Post some time ago that when American teenagers move to Israel, you think they've got an easy role? No, because the native Israelis just sort of make life miserable for them until they really get acclimated. I mean, that's just common. Right here in America, you move from one part of the United States to another part, and you all know the same thing. I don't care where it is. It's always the same. Well, they treat you as. You're an outsider. See? You're not part of us. Well, Israel was no different. And so now these Grecian widows who were not part of the original Israeli or the Jewish citizenry were being slighted when it came time to hand out the goodies. See? All right, so there arose a murmuring because of that, because their widows were being neglected in the daily, what? Ministration. What does that tell you? Somebody's in control. They had to be. And so it was an administration problem that they had to deal with immediately. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.